Whether it be for your car or your house, it can be incredibly overwhelming trying to get your head around what kind of cleaning chemicals you actually need and trying to find that middle ground between not being a sucker for fancy buzzword marketing and actually getting a product that effectively does the job. Well, if you are in a situation, there is no need to worry because I'm about to explain everything that you need to know about cleaning chemicals. And so to make understanding all of this much easier, I've grouped all these cleaning chemicals into three main categories. Now number one is cleaning chemicals that dissolve your mess. Number two, I'll be talking about chemicals that don't actually do any cleaning at all, but they kill germs and viruses. And finally, are chemicals and products that kind of scratch away your mess, otherwise known as abrasives, and so now we can actually start the first part. And this is chemicals that dissolve your mess. So this is where some real chemistry magic happens. First up, I have to explain what a solvent is. And so a solvent is a chemical that either dilutes or diffuses other substances. But the problem here though, is that a chemical that may be a solvent for one type of mess is not a solvent for another type of mess. So let's just say that there's a bit of salt and it's kind of crystallized itself onto a surface. And so if you were to approach it with say a cleaning product like this isopropyl alcohol, you'll find that this chemical will be useless for it. However, if you were to use water as instead as in the pure stuff that we drink, you'll find that it actually kind of melts the salt and then mixes with it and then drips off and cleans the mess. So with that, you can jump to the conclusion that this isn't a solvent, whereas water is a solvent. However, if you get a situation where you've got like little thumbprints all over your phone, you'll find that water will basically be useless for this, but if you were to spray a bit of this into your microfiber cloth, that'll actually remove your fingerprints quite easily. And so, to circle around to my point here, different types of messes require different types of solvents. And so when learning about this, I had a bit of a temporary freak out a moment. I mean, how are you supposed to remember what chemical cleans what stains? And it's just, there's too many types of stains to keep a track of and how are you supposed to remember all this? But as you learn more and more about this, it actually gets easier the more that you learn. And it's like this because every chemical that we are to come across with in our lives fit in this thing that is known as a pH scale. That's pH stands for potential hydrogen, but to properly explain that, I'll have to get extremely scientific and give you a whole bunch of information that's gonna be useless for you actually cleaning a stain off a surface. And so this pH scale goes from zero to 14. And generally speaking, most of the things that we deal with on our everyday lives sit somewhere around the seven mark. I mean, for example, distilled water is a perfect seven. And another thing to remember about the scale as well is that it is a logarithmic scale. And with this logarithmic scale, unlike normal scales where things move in a straight line, this moves at a, a, a logarithmic or an exponential rate. But just as a simple real world example of real products, you find that something that sits as a pH 13 is one million times more alkaline or basic than say something that is sitting at a seven. And so this logarithmic scale looks a little bit like this as far as its effect. So anyway, we don't need to stress too much about that. And so most of the things that we'll deal with on a daily everyday lives will sit somewhere between six to nine on the scale. So that's the pH scale. Now just temporarily store that in your memory because we're about to come back to that. And so now onto the mess side. Now out of every mess in the world, you'll find that there's actually two main categories that they fall into. And so you've got organic and inorganic. And so for inorganic, we have stains that like calcium, lime, and rust. However, for organic stains, we basically have the majority of stains that you come across in your life. And this is anything that is derived from grease, oils, bloods, wines, all sorts of things. And so just to really simplify how to remember what stains are what, organic stains come from things that are at one stage were living. And that includes oil because 65 million years ago, it came from a living dinosaur or a living plant. And so that's why it still comes in the organic category. However, if the stain comes from, say, something like a rock, like calcium or lime, well then it's an inorganic stain. And so, if it's living, it's organic, and if it's not living, it's inorganic. And, alright, now do you remember that pH scale I was talking about before? Well, you want an alkaline cleaner to clean organic messes, and you want an acid cleaner to clean inorganic messes. If you remember one thing from this entire video, remember that. Alkaline for organic and acidic for inorganic. 
So, okay, with that being the case, why don't we just use level 13 or 14 cleaners for every organic stain, and why don't we just use uh, level 0 or 1 acids for every organic stain? And that is because we have to be mindful of the surface that we're cleaning the mess off. And so yes, you may successfully remove that stain from the bonnet of your car or from your kitchen top counter, but what is the point of removing a stain if you've now left this really big chemical scratch mark on, on, the, on the surface of your prized thing that you're trying to clean? So as an everyday example, you find that dish soap is actually way higher in the pH scale than a car shampoo. And if you were to use a dish soap on a car, it's actually strong enough to take away the car's clear coat. So just to go back to my point, as everyday realistic examples, on a pH level 9 you'll find carpet shampoos and then at, when we go from 11 to 13 that's when we have the really strong stuff like sugar soap, bleach, degreasers and heavy duty cleaners. And so that's 8 to 14. But what about 0 to 6? What, what are some real world examples of that? Well, at pH 3 we have orange juice. And then we have vinegar at a pH 2 and we have a CLR or calcium lime rust cleaner and that is at the low pH 2s. And then at the zeros we get really strong acids and so strong in fact that they're never ever used for cleaning and that is for things like pool acid or battery acid and just really corrosive stuff that you just never want to be in there. And so going back to before when I was talking about how uh, the chemicals on the same side of a scale do a similar job but just level of severity, if you have a calcium lime or rust stain that you need to clean, vinegar would do the job, but CLR would do the job with a lot less elbow grease. And while saying that, normal detergents would be completely useless for this type of mess. And just one last thing to note about chemicals that dissolve away your mess before I move on to the next section. If you are using a detergent or you're just using some kind of general cleaning product, you'll have a much easier time elbow grease wise if you use warm water rather than cold water. And the reason for this is that it goes down to the whole sub-science atomic level where the molecules are moving faster and then it creates more gaps and opportunity for molecules to interact with each other. But basically, if you just remember that warm water makes it easier to clean than it does with just cold water, uh, you have a bit of an easy time cleaning stains as well. If you spray this chemical onto your dirty surface and then you just let it sit there and then you let it dry, the chemical will be useless. The chemical only has a good effect when it's actually still wet. And so if you just spray it on and leave it there and let it cake on, you'll have to spray it again so that way you can either wipe it off or it could drip off. And also with that being said, you have to give the chemical a little bit of time too to actually bond with all the grease. If you imagine that this ruler is one of these cleaners, on one end it is attracted to water, but on this end it is attracted to grease and dirt and grime. And so you've got to give it a little bit of time to actually get in there and let all the particles be attracted to this. And then before it's all wiped away, you wipe in a bit more water, you wipe it away, and then the water takes it, the mess away with it. And so that pretty much covers everything about chemicals that dissolve your mess away. And now we'll move on to the next section, and that is chemicals that kill germs and nothing else but kill germs. Now I put these into a separate category to other cleaning chemicals because whilst other cleaning chemicals remove the germs from someone's hands or someone or a surface, these chemicals don't remove anything from anywhere, they just kill what's there there and they just remain on the surface. And there are a few products out there that have mixed germ killing agents with detergents and so it's a bit of a two on one, but again that is the exception rather than the norm. So the first thing to mention about these sanitizers or disinfectants or germ killing agents is that the method of application is very much different to detergents. As I was mentioning before, with a detergent you actually want to wipe off the stain whilst the cleaning chemical is still wet. However, with a sanitizer or disinfectant you want to do the exact opposite. <gasps> you actually want to spray it on and then let it completely dry because until that chemical is completely dry on the surface with the germs, some germs will still be alive. And so, why are we told to wash our hands during a global pandemic when washing your hands doesn't necessarily kill the germs? Well, there is a good reason. The big reason being is that when you wash your hands, you're transferring all the germs, although they're still alive, from your hands and down into the kitchen sink and then into the plumbing. However, when you sanitize your hands, you're spraying the germs and they're dying on your hands and dead germs are still on your hands, and so they're not gonna affect anyone else, but that's, that's why it's still preferable to wash your hands as opposed to sanitize your hands. Both methods are good and effective, but washing is just a little bit more hygienic in the big picture of things. 
for German killing chemicals, it should be noted as well that there's different levels of severity. So on the lower end, we have chemicals like sanitizer. And these do kill an overwhelming majority of the viruses and germs that you may come across. And if any of you are thinking about this question, yes, they do kill COVID. But next on the chemical kill chain, we move to products like bleach. Bleach is a disinfectant and these pretty much kill anything that it touches. And so basically all bacteria and viruses. And now obviously viruses is not the only thing that bleach kills. So please don't be thinking like the former leader of the free world and telling people to drink bleach to cure COVID. That is a horrible idea. Leaving bleach on a surface for about 10 minutes will definitely kill all the germs there, but it may also damage the surface of what you're cleaning as well. Whereas a sanitizer, that's far less likely to happen. And here's another unexpected benefit about bleach is that it can actually be useful for removing grease stains as well. Because although it is primarily a germ killing agent, it also is pretty high up on the pH scale. And with this, it forms a chemical reaction of grease that causes the grease to oxidize, which in turn makes it much easier to clean off. And so for that reason, you do find many two-in-one cleaning agents that both remove greasy stains and kill germs. And usually those chemical agents have some form of bleach in it. And so this is why bleach is such a popular cleaning product, despite all its really obvious safety risks. And bleach is not the only disinfecting chemical that you can find that is out there as well. Another very popular cleaning chemical is isoprol alcohol, as this kills germs and it also breaks up grease as well. Now, the next section, abrasive cleaners. Now, this is kind of a substance that is used for those messes that really need to be scraped off despite the best efforts of trying to dissolve a mess. Now, they contain very, very small mineral particles which creates a bit of a scarring effect that removes stubborn stains. The best way that I sort of envisage this, it's like putting bits of sand into a bit of cream, and so that way you're kind of scratching away at the mess. And you can kind of amplify the effect of this uh, by using either steel wool or a scarra to try and get at that mess as well. And so it's kind of more just an amplifying tool for these types of uh, cleaning products. And so naturally of this, there is a bit of a hesitation to use an abrasive cleaner because what if you do damage to the surface that you're trying to clean? And that is a legitimate concern and there are too many examples to list where this has actually gone bad for people when they've tried to use it on the cars or things that you should never use an abrasive cleaner on. If you do want to try an abrasive cleaner but you're a little bit hesitant about the damage that it could do, a great place to start is with baking soda. And you can use this to clean your kitchen sink because although it does actually scratch away at it, it doesn't, it's not quite sharp enough to do the damage to the kitchen sink itself. And so with baking soda being on the sort of calmer end of the abrasive cleaners. On the more aggressive ends, you get products like metal polish, which basically uses the exact same principle, except it scratches very aggressively and can be used for cleaning bits of metal that you need to have cleaned for whatever reason. And so I really hope you found this video useful. And if you like content like this, uh, please check out some of my other videos about uh, when should you use WD-40, when should you use a silicon spray, or when should you use a specialist spray. Uh, it's a video I'm very proud of. Or um, I have another video in uh, why microfibers are probably the best invention ever to hit the cleaning world. Anyway, thanks for watching and I'll, I'll, if you haven't already, I'll please like and subscribe and see you around. Bye!